Okay, we're going to get started. We have a, a jam-packed meeting tonight, but welcome everybody to the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. Uh, just a quick, some quick introductions before we get to tonight's speakers. Uh, my name is Michael Ivan. I'm one of the brain tumor and skull-based specialists here at the University of Miami and director of our symposium on brain tumors. Also our um, director of research for our brain tumor initiative and uh, neuro-oncology. I'm joined today by my co-directors, Dr. Morcos, who's professor and co-chairman of our neurosurgery department here at UM, director of cerebrovascular and skull base, as well as Dr. Komatar, who's professor and program director of our residency program and director of the UMBTI and surgical neuro-oncology. Also uh, joined by Dr. Benjamin, who's assistant professor and director of our skull base uh, Kane's dissection laboratory, also a brain tumor and skull base expert. Uh, each week we put on these symposiums. This is number 29 ever since uh, COVID started. It feels like uh, not much has changed since we started. We're still in the midst of COVID pandemic, but um, many, many thanks to our administrators, Christina, Roberto, Ingrid, uh, Damari, and Ignacio for all of the work they've done over the last uh, seven months, eight months uh, to make this such a success. We have over 7,000 people registered for these uh, talks. Uh, with many thousands of people who watch them on YouTube and join us live every week. If you have any questions about uh, the program or University of Miami, you could always find more information out on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, as well as we have a website where you could find more about um, our talks, symposiums, and grand rounds. A uh, quick update into some of the other symposiums happening uh, for later this week, tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Morcos is putting on the Cerebrovascular Skull Base Symposium, and we have a great talk about complications, which is always important for every uh, neurosurgeon and resident to hear about, uh, with a great panel of, of speakers, Dr. McDermott, Dr. Barker, Dr. Daniel Mefti, uh, and Ashok would be all joining us to kind of talk about their uh, kind of uh, approaches to different complications in skull base surgery. Also, we started a pediatric symposium. The next one will be the first week of December and details of that one will be uh, provided shortly. Uh, we're taking a, a break of our symposium next week because uh, it's Thanksgiving. So everybody hopefully will have a, a great Thanksgiving. And um, even if you're gonna be by yourself and not traveling, enjoy the time off. And we have three more uh, great symposiums planned for uh, 2020, the second, ninth and 16th. And, and we'll let you know about those details very, very shortly. Uh, some housekeeping uh, participants. We try to make this as interactive as possible. Please use the Q&A button uh, to ask your questions throughout Dr. Zada's talk tonight, and we'll try to get to as many as we can throughout the night. We don't offer CME, but you will get an email confirming, uh, confirming your particip participation. And please be sure to like, follow, and share all of our videos, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, so we continue to grow and share the great knowledge of all of the speakers. Uh, tonight, we, we have an absolutely uh, outstanding panel. Uh, 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 these are all kind of uh, their own, uh, just so budding uh, neurosurgeons, I mean, uh, key neurosurgeons and, and brain tumors all kind of bringing to the, the light minimally invasive neurosurgery with all multiple publications about their techniques, uh, which are, are kind of uh, in a really popular area of neurosurgery, which is port-based surgery. Uh, Kaisor especially uh, has, has really been doing some fantastic work with deep thalamic gliomas um, and has really been pushing the limits. He's a professor of neurosurgery, a vice chair of education, and the residency program director at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, where he also acts as the director of brain tumor surgery and director of skull base and minimally invasive uh, cranial surgery. Dr. Zechariah joins us again, associate professor at Penn State, also director of their neuro-oncology program and skull base program. Dr. Hamp, assistant professor and minimally invasive specialist uh, from Westchester Medical Center, where he also acts as a section chief of neurosurgical oncology. And our own Ashish Shah, who's our chief resident here at University of Miami. He's also one of our 25 neurosurgery fellows. Uh, also been really pushing the limits here with minimally invasive neurosurgery. Ashish is gonna be joining the NIH next year for a fellowship um, in, in clinical trials and, and neurosurgery. Uh, tonight, our, our keynote speaker is Dr. Gabriel Azada. Um, very, very excited to introduce uh, Gabe tonight because not only is he an outstanding uh, clinician scientist, uh, a fantastic minimum invasive neurosurgeon, a great speaker, but he's also a great friend and mentor to me, uh, and I've known him for many years, uh, so it's really an honor for him to join us. Um, he is a, a world-renowned expert in pituitary endoscopic and minimally invasive surgery. Uh, and has really devoted his career towards this, uh, where he works at USC with a very, very high volume um, uh, brain tumor practice, over 250 to 300 cases a year. He's professor of neurosurgery there, 
also with joint appointments in otolaryngology and internal medicine, director of their brain tumor center and associate residency program director. Um, he also is director of their um, pituitary center and has his own fellowship in minimal invasive surgery, endoscopic surgery and skull based surgery, which um, uh, has just been phenomenal uh, as, as fellows say nothing but the best of him. Uh, he also directs the, the radio surgery center and has extensive experience with gamma knife and, and cyber knife um, and has won multiple faculty teaching awards for his just excellent mentorship and, and teaching throughout his time as a program director and fellowship director. He works uh, as a neurotrauma consultant at the NFL. Um, and, and beyond all that, he's just an excellent scientist. Uh, he has over 140 peer group verbal papers. Uh, you could see one of his most important uh, works here is his book on Atlas of Cellular and Paracellular Lesions, which uh, for anybody interested in minimally invasive and endoscopic surgery, I highly encourage you to read that work. Uh, he also has a full-time laboratory and has an R1 uh, funded grant uh, devoted to pituitary tumors. Uh, which he's done some really exciting uh, work on. So overall, very, very excited to have Dr. Zada join us tonight and to hear his aspects and techniques for fork-based and minimally invasive surgery. Thank you so much, Mike. That was a, a really nice uh, uh, introduction. Um, thank you to everyone over there at University of Miami. Uh, um, Carolina, it's good to see you and, uh, and, uh, and the whole team into the panelists and the whole, uh, the whole team running the show over there. So really excited and uh, honored to be invited uh, to share some of my experience with minimally invasive uh, cranial tumor surgery. So let's jump right in. Um, I have uh, um, a lot of things I want to cover, and um, I'm going to move pretty quickly, especially at the beginning here, um, just to cover the scope of everything here. So um, here are my disclosures. So what I want to cover today is um, kind of, uh, at least at USC, our catalog of minimally invasive uh, and endoscopic surgical techniques for adult brain tumor uh, surgery. Um, some of the benefits that endoscopy has added to, to this spectrum of practice, um, uh, review some of the most common approaches that really facilitate uh, 360 degree access uh, uh, to the skull base in particular, but um, more recently to the subcortical space and ventricles as well. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about blue light endoscopy at the end and some of the things we've been doing uh, here that I'm just really excited about. So, um, we all know the benefits of endoscopy. We're now kind of two decades into um, at least the world of endoscopic skull base surgery and about a century out from where the first endoscopes were used in the brain. Uh, um, these are some of the earliest candle and filament powered endoscopes. Walter Dandy was a huge pioneer in pediatrics and then Harold Hopkins uh, um, uh, invented the rigid glass rod endoscope that we still use quite a bit. Angled endoscopy is, a, is a, um, a, a huge deal that offers major benefits, especially looking around uh, anatomical corners. And I think that's really one of the standout uh, um, features of endoscopy that have lent itself to, to really becoming so popular. This was an article out of um, our shop in 1977 describing the various uses of the angled endoscope for cranial and spinal surgery. And then as I mentioned, about a quarter century ago was uh, when Dr. Joe and Carrao and a couple others reported the first purely endoscopic uh, pituitary surgery. So we've come a long way. Um, this is a, 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 an older video of a craniopharyngioma surgery. And I show it because we get a view of anatomy that you don't get uh, anywhere else um, with a microscope uh, where an exposure like this, seeing the basilar apex, the midbrain, the mammillary bodies, um, you'd be hard pressed to have with a microscopic view. But obviously this is something we see almost every time we remove at least a craniopharyngioma. And then I love comparing these videos. Um, on the left is one of the earliest videos of endonasal, or I'm sorry, of, uh, in this case, a uh, um, uh, uh, sublabial uh, endoscopy um, with an endoscope inserted through a speculum uh, by Professor Guillot in 1962, compared to what we're doing in 2020 with way improved optics and instrumentation, and really the ability to, to perform uh, micro dissection. So um, we're, you know, we're, we're almost at the point where the microdissection is as good as open uh, procedures uh, for neurosurgery. And uh, as one of my mentors, Dr. Apuzzo, used to always call it, um, there's a minimalist march in neurosurgery. We see it all in really every subspecialty, uh, endovascular, radiosurgery, obviously tumor, uh, MIS spine, uh, and so many others. Um, so we know there are major benefits of minimally invasive procedures. We've also seen some evolution in optics, and I'm going to talk a lot about optical technology. Uh, uh, um, I work a lot with um, uh, uh, some colleagues 
uh, with the subcortical surgery group, and, and some of these slides are repurposed uh, from there. But um, the idea of going from a microscope to endoscope and maybe a, an exoscope, which we've heard so much about recently, um, and whether this is a real evolution, uh, I'm going to talk about later. But I'd like you to keep this in mind as I talk about various approaches. So as I mentioned earlier, we really have 360 degree access now to the skull base with minimally invasive and endoscopic procedures, as well as the subcortical and, and intraventricular system. And in terms of the way we categorize these, um, the oldest and most traditional form of neuroendoscopy is working in the ventricles through a channel endoscope. Uh, this is working in a CSF medium, and we don't have the ability to perform two-handed microdissection through a channel endoscope at this time. Um, uh, so there are some limitations to this that I'm going to address later. Uh, this is a colloid cyst operation, and I used to do my colloid cyst this way. I no longer do that, and I'll, I'll address that later. Um, I still use this for ETVs and biopsies primarily, occasionally a septum pellucidotomy or two. Uh, the bulk of our endoscopic uh, work is through the nose, uh, and obviously there's a whole catalog of endoscopic skull base surgery that I'll, I'll review, but I'm going to really try to focus on, on some of the other ones, which are um, uh, keyhole procedures that can be purely endoscopic or endoscopic assisted. In this case, uh, you're seeing the optic nerves and fenestration uh, of an arachnoid cyst. You may ask, why are we fenestrating an arachnoid cyst through a, a keyhole eyebrow procedure and not through the nose? And that's a, it's a very valid question. Um, this is about a one hour procedure and arachnoid cysts have a, 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 a known higher risk of CSF leaks after surgery. So an eyebrow procedure like this, the patient goes home post-op day one and you never have to worry, or not never, rarely have to worry about a CSF leak. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some cases where I think uh, a keyhole craniotomy is superior to an endonasal procedure. And finally, what I hope to spend a, a bulk of the time on are uh, port-based approaches to the subcortical space and ventricles. Uh, and, and I look forward to hearing from our panelists about this as well. Uh, this is kind of the development of our service line over the last decade. We're now over a thousand cases. Most of them are endonasal, but you can see how we're also developing um, uh, um, uh, carefully selected cases for the other indications as well. So I'm gonna start by talking a little about endonasal approaches, um, just as kind of a review of what, what we can access through the nose now. And um, two thirds of my endonasal cases are direct, meaning we go directly to the cella. And uh, the other one third are, are extended, meaning we go all the way from uh, the frontal sinus along an entire arc, essentially down to the upper cervical spine and frame and magnum, and a variety of lateral approaches as well, whether they're transmaxillary or transpterygoid approaches. And the principle here is that we maintain um, skull-based surgery uh, uh, fundamentals, which are bony removal to expose critical neurovascular structures, uh, minimizing or eliminating brain retraction, and performing two-handed microdissection with an emphasis on reconstruction. So let's start by just talking about the, the direct approach to the pituitary gland. This is obviously used most commonly for pituitary tumors, followed by Rathke's cleft cysts. Um, this is a Cushing's case. So microadenoma, you get a beautiful view of the cella. You want to expose the entire cella. And then uh, where, where possible, perform an extra capsular dissection, especially for a microadenoma. And so uh, um, this is the technique we'll use routinely. It's associated with a... a, a higher remission rate and faster drop off of postoperative uh, cortisol levels. And here we're sparing the normal pituitary gland and working our way around this pseudo capsule. And knowing we got pretty good resection here, checking the, the margins, et cetera. And this patient did really well. What about smaller tumors that you can't see uh, on MRI? Well, we'll expose the whole gland and explore, but we've been using a seven Tesla MRI to uh, try to pick up these tumors. And we've had a couple cases now where we can see the tumor on a 7T and not on a 1.5 or 3T. And this correlates with IPSS sampling as well. So um, we're excited about the prospect of this um, in particular for Cushing's disease. So I talked a little about extended approaches and most pituitary tumors don't require extended approaches. Um, and that's because you can um, often get the tumor to descend from the supracellar space through this waste, uh, which is the, the compromised diaphragma cella. And when you see the arachnoid come down like this, you're in good shape. It means you've um, gotten 
uh, uh, you know, at least most of the tumor out and, uh, and an extended approach would not be needed. The angled endoscope has changed our ability to reach upwards as well. And, and sometimes the tumors don't want to readily descend, especially if they're more firm tumors. So uh, this tumor was going right up to the, the optic nerves and chiasm, and we're looking upwards with a 30 degree scope to make sure that we've removed that tumor and decompress the optic nerve. So one of the major benefits of angled endoscopy there. Here's a, our, our most recent look at our direct series, um, over 400 cases, mostly pituitary tumors. Um, I do my direct approaches by myself without ENT, and, and I work very closely with ENT on extended approaches. That's just something I learned 10 years ago, and I do an approach in about 15 minutes. Our median OR time is less than two hours for, a pitu for our direct series and a median hospital stay of two days. Uh, gross total resection in 58% of pituitary tumors, and hormonal remission in 82% of functional pituitary tumors. And here's just um, the most common complications you'll see in pituitary uh, surgery. Our post-op CSF leak rate was 4% and new hypopituitarism in 3%. One carotid artery injury in, in the direct series with no neurological sequelae. Let's talk a little about extended approaches. Um, and uh, we're going to just um, start by talking about what's necessary for these. These are much more involved and intricate than direct approaches. So this is really where you need all your uh, instruments available. Um, uh, Neuronavigation is highly recommended. You need a drill or something for bony removal, a micro Doppler in every case. Uh, uh, I use lumbar drains for my extended approaches and there's good level one evidence to support that as well. Uh, pedicle nasal septal flap and then um, any kind of monitoring available as well. So this case was a tuberculum cell meningioma uh, with vision loss, and um, and here we are working tumor away from the chiasm, and uh, you'll soon see the ACOM complex uh, as well above it, and uh, her vision got dramatically better uh, after surgery. So starting uh, at the most anterior point, which is our, our transcribriform approaches, this is um, used for meningiomas of the olfactory groove or uh, stesioneuroblastomas. This beautiful intricate anatomy uh, involving the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries, the olfactory blasts, uh, uh, olfactory bulbs, and uh, and tracts, um, and you'll see you'll see this entire uh, area after removing uh, the bone and dura here. So this was a, a large olfactory neuroblastoma. Here we are removing the cristagalli, and then working our way around the tumor, dissecting away from the gyrus rectus on both sides, and then ultimately away from the olfactory uh, nerves and the orbital frontal arteries there and able to get a good, a good resection there. And then of course, focusing on reconstruction uh, with fascia lata and a pedicled flap. Moving more posteriorly are the transplanum and transtuberculum approaches. These are used most commonly for craniopharyngiomas and selected meningiomas. And again, I'm gonna talk about meningiomas a little bit and, and case selection. Um, but craniopharyngiomas are really what lend themselves the best to this. For the residents and students who are uh, attending today, um, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, pieces of art. It's by M.C. Escher, and it's called Above and Below. If you haven't seen it, I, 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 I would uh, um, suggest you look at it. It's, it's about perspective and seeing things from different uh, angles. And we do that all the time with uh, surgical anatomy. Um, this is from Roten and you're seeing the uh, anterior clinoid, optic nerve, and carotid artery. Um, from a traditional view that we're used to seeing it with a craniotomy, but then understanding that you need to, under, to appreciate these relationships from below as well, endonasally. The same goes for the course of the carotid artery, whether you're used to seeing it from a terional or OZ vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis an endonasal or extended endonasal approach to understand uh, the 3D anatomy and, uh, and course of the carotid artery through all these bony and dural structures. So when you do a transtuberculum transplanum approach, you get these beautiful views of the supracellar space. Um, obviously, the optic chiasm, uh, infundibulum, superior hypophyseal arteries. But then you can look up at the lamina terminalis uh, into the third ventricle and see the ACOM complex as well. So I mentioned that most pituitary tumors don't require an extended approach. Well, some do. And, and sometimes you'll see some that spill over the tuberculum into the anterior cranial fossa. Um, that's a good sign that you may need an extended approach. It's very hard to reach up into this area and carefully dissect tumor away uh, or get it to descend from this, this compartment. 
So here's an example of that. This was a gentleman with profound vision loss, um, as well as a right oculomotor nerve palsy. You can see extension into the oculomotor cistern and obviously spilling over the tuberculum here. So this was a classic indication for an extended uh, transtuberculum approach. I'll often start with just the cellar approach because I wanna get an, a sense of what the consistency of the tumor is before opening the supracellar space. Um, we've exposed the dura here, and now we're, we've opened dura, we're dissecting the arachnoid, and then it's really about two-handed microdissection. Um, uh, these pituitary tumors have a pseudo capsule, but they can be densely adherent to the chiasm, nerves, and carotid arteries. So this is really where careful uh, two-handed microdissection comes in. And we were able to get um, uh, an overwhelming majority of this tumor out. And there's our reconstruction. And you can see the post-op scan here uh, was read as a gross total. Um, I think I left a, a very small amount of residual on the optic uh, chiasm uh, to protect it. And his vision um, went back to normal, actually. Uh, craniopharyngiomas are, are really what lend themselves to these approaches. Um, that's often because the long axis of these tumors is in the direction of your endonasal approach. And um, often they're cystic and solid, which also lends themselves to an endonasal approach. So um, we see a whole variety of craniopharyngiomas. The first chance you get to remove these is the most important. Once they've recurred or been radiated, it's a much different operation. Uh, this was a rather large uh, adamantinomatous uh, cranio. And now we're working to dissect it away from the chiasm. We've done, a, um, we've removed the dorsum cella and, uh, and posterior clinoids, and now we're dissecting it away from the basilar apex, PCOM, PCAs, uh, oculomotor nerve is here, and thalamoperforating vessels. And then able to get this to descend from the, uh, the third ventricle and mammillary bodies. And so uh, I mentioned this view earlier. It's one of the most beautiful views we get in, uh, in neurosurgery, in my opinion. And uh, we were able to get uh, this tumor out for this young guy. Tuberculum cell meningiomas, I kind of mentioned already. Um, here's the approach. It's a transtuberculum transplantum approach. We use a microdoppler in every case. We cauterize the superior intercavernous sinus. We then start to debulk the tumor and then dissect it away from the chiasm. Again, two-handed microdissection. So I'll say that I'm a, I go 50-50 on doing these through the nose versus um, a, a different approach, often an eyebrow, which I'm going to talk about later. I'm a huge fan of a supraorbital approach for um, planum and tuberculum meningiomas. Um, I think that a well-done craniotomy can get a patient home in two days, whereas an extended endonasal approach, um, my patients are usually in-house for at least three or four days. Um, sometimes they have a lumbar, often because they have a lumbar drain as well. But um, uh, I think uh, sometimes that's the way to go, at least in my practice. And finally, I, I want to touch base about transclival approaches. And I, I love starting uh, this section by, by showing this textbook by really some of the world experts in tumor uh, neurosurgery. Um, this was from 1992 or 1993, but they used to call uh, the clivus no man's land. And I really like that because there were not good approaches to the clivus. Um, and uh, it's a, obviously a very intricate uh, uh, compartment. Um, uh, you're, you're working between the, the, the clival uh, segment of the carotid arteries, obviously around the vertebrobasilar complex and multiple cranial nerves. And the bony work can be challenging as well. Well, chordomas are extradural tumors. So it's better to approach them extradurally when possible. And that's why I think the endonasal approach has really lent itself uh, to removing chordomas. This was a 17-year-old uh, high school senior who was going to play uh, basketball in college, but he developed diplopia and a sixth nerve palsy. And he had this chordoma with intradural extension, compression of the pons right near the basilar artery. This is how they used to approach these tumors uh, with a, what's called a, a, a transbasal or bifrontal approach, uh, retraction of the frontal lobes, a very morbid approach um, uh, going back to the clivus, or they used to just open the face up with a craniofacial uh, resection, also morbid. So if this was your family member, uh, you, you would obviously want them to have a, a minimally invasive approach without brain retraction. And so uh, wide bony removal, understanding where the carotid arteries are. So the Doppler is critical in these cases, opening up the cavernous sinus to try to remove 
some tumor from there. Obviously, we'll encounter some venous bleeding that we can take care of. And then we remove the, the, the clivus and open the dura. And now we're dissecting this chordoma away from the, the basilar artery and the, the, the small pontine perforating vessels and the, the pons itself. And again, the first operation is really your, your shot to uh, optimally treat uh, this patient. And then it's about reconstruction. I like to use fat for uh, dead space. And then uh, I like to use fascia lata uh, or some type of fascial substitute to, to reconstruct dura. And um, this guy did uh, very well. We left a little residual in the posterior cavernous sinus where we couldn't get to it, but um, he went back and graduated from high school six weeks later and then went on to have proton beam radiation. And uh, here he is uh, two years later, um, was doing well. All right, I'm gonna change gears and talk about um, uh, uh, some other uh, uh, minimally invasive approaches. I'm gonna um, talk a little about the eyebrow approach, which is probably my favorite approach in all of neurosurgery. And um, just again, for the trainees in the room, understanding these relationships uh, of, of various approaches uh, to the cellar and supracellar region. A terional is a very uh, lateral approach. It's obviously a workhorse for us and I use it all the time. Um, and, but it is, it's quite a lateral approach. So when you want a more anterior to posterior tra trajectory, um, we'll often use an OZ or a superorbital approach. And they, they, uh, they'll give you in some ways overlapping um, uh, uh, trajectories. What's nice about the, the superorbital approach is it gets you working between the optic nerves. Um, and you can really work in that supracellar space around the infundibulum. It will get you all the way back to the basilar apex as needed. Uh, so um, this was uh, really described early by Pernetsky's group for a variety of uh, aneurysms. And then um, it's fantastic for um, uh, quite a bit of uh, anterior skull base tumors, um, uh, meningiomas of the olfactory groove, planum and tuberculum sphenoidale, uh, or even uh, uh, medial clinoidal uh, um, uh, lesions can be treated with this. Um, I use it as a salvage approach when patients have had uh, complex endonasal surgery um, uh, once or a few times, and I don't want to go back in through the nose. This is usually my, uh, my backup approach. So about half of my eyebrow uh, keyhole cases are, are redos for some type of operation where they've often had an endonasal case before. And uh, there's a lot of ways to do the incision. You can do an eyelid. Um, in patients without uh, um, uh, thick eyebrows or who don't want an, uh, a scar on their face, we'll do a traditional hairline incision with a small supraorbital craniotomy. And so uh, uh, here's an example of a case for a, a, a planum and tuberculum cella meningioma. We'll make the incision uh, right in the eyebrow. I like to use these low profile Lone Star retractors, make a burr hole um, uh, at, at, at the McCarty keyhole, and then about a three by two centimeter craniotomy um, after drilling down the undersurface of the orbital rim. And now we're debulking the tumor. It gets you working right between the optic nerves, which is essentially a safe zone. And then you can devascularize the tumor and uh, take it off the, the skull base. Now we're dissecting it away from the chiasm. Here's the right optic nerve. And then we're looking over at the left optic nerve. And that's where you have to um, uh, really be careful is working contralaterally, uh, a medial to the optic nerve where the carotid will be um, behind the tumor. And then our reconstruction there. So these tend to heal really nicely. Um, this is a patient who uh, a lot like me is follicularly uh, challenged and, uh, and uh, had a, a, a decent uh, scar uh, recovery here. Um, we do a multi-layer closure and a subcutic at the end uh, with some Dermabond. Just some examples of where I would use this. Um, this is a patient who had a, a firm pituitary tumor that I did not get out with an endonasal procedure. I didn't wanna come back in, he had a flap up. This was a straight shot with a, with a, a, a eyebrow approach. We were able to get that out. Here's a tuberculum cell meningioma uh, treated with an eyebrow approach. And here's a planum meningioma treated with an eyebrow approach. Now you could do these endonasally and no one I think would fault you for doing that. But these patients went home, I think post-op day one or two. And I think that's hard to beat without, without a lot of the sinus pathology uh, or com comorbidities that could arise. So let's change gears again. I'm gonna talk a little about other uh, approaches. Um, uh, we've been doing purely endoscopic approaches to the pineal region, um, which I think has been uh, uh, really fantastic. Um, 
There are many ways to approach pineal tumors. I'm not going to go into that, um, but uh, the one I'm going to focus on is the uh, supracerebellar infratentorial, which is one of the most common approaches. And uh, uh, there's a, a whole host of complex venous anatomy here working beneath the tentorium uh, to access the, the pineal region. We do a very small craniotomy right below the torcula, uh, right in this area. Again, about a three, three by uh, two or three by three centimeter craniotomy. And you compare how these were done in sitting position with a microscope vis-a-vis -vis doing them in concord position. Um, and I think uh, um, for me, it's been a, a game changer ergonomically as well. So this was a woman who had a pineal cytoma. She presented with symptoms of, of normal pressure hydrocephalus, um, not acute hydrocephalus. And here we are, um, we don't use a microscope at all. Here's the endoscope beneath the tentorium. There's the vein of Galen. Um, we're sacrificing uh, uh, um, the, the superior cerebellar vein uh, there and working around uh, the tumor there, dissecting it away from the tectum. And then we're gonna get a gush of CSF as we are uh, now in the posterior third ventricle. Again, working our way around this tumor really critical to have the right instruments. This is a, a, it is a reach, but the endoscope gets you all the way back there, gets you these beautiful views of the third ventricle. And then the last component coming off the tectum there. And we know we got this tumor out. Um, her symptoms improved and she did not need any CSF uh, diversion. Here's another example. Uh, this gentleman had a, a, a melanoma metastasis to the pineal region that hemorrhaged with acute symptoms. And we did not want to gamma knife them uh, with these acute symptoms. So um, very similar approach. And again, we're, we're able to work our way around this tumor capsule, dissect it away from uh, the surrounding uh, uh, tectum and venous structures, and then get into the posterior third ventricle. Uh, he had a transient paranod syndrome that improved, and then we still gamma knifed the cavity, of course, but he's done really well with actually no recurrence whatsoever. And there's the, uh, there's the post-op. So that's how we're doing pineal surgery. We're also using the endoscope in the posterior fossa um, uh, and CP angle. Uh, I will use them on trigeminal neuralgia cases for, uh, to look around corners, but not primarily. And I, I don't do acoustic neuromas with an endoscope either. I know some people have, I have not. Um, but I will use it for epidermoid tumors. It is um, absolutely perfect for epidermoid tumors because you can look around anatomical corners and epidermoid tumors love to grow within these cisternal arachnoid spaces. So uh, making sure that you can see around the brainstem and around cranial nerves is critical. So here's a microscopic approach. We've exhausted our resection with that. So we'll put in a 30 degree endoscope. We'll look around corners and What's great about epidermoids is you can, you can use a curette and a suction and, and uh, get a lot more of it out safely. Um, so, uh, so we, we uh, were able to write up this small series uh, several years ago and have added to it quite a bit. The other thing we're doing is we're using the endoscope in the fourth ventricle and not from a traditional uh, trans aqueductal approach, but from below. So when we do a transvermian, uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, when we do a telovelar approach now, uh, we will also use an angled endoscope to look all the way up to the superior medullary vellum and to the aqueduct. Um, the purpose of this is to make sure we've decompressed the aqueduct and removed as much tumor as possible. So here's a microscopic, microscopic approach for a, a glioneuronal tumor of the fourth ventricle. And I'm just going to zip ahead here because now we've inserted an angled endoscope through the, the um, the foramen of uh, Majandi, and we're looking up at the superior medullary vellum and at the aqueduct. And if I've decompressed the aqueduct, I know that her hydrocephalus is essentially relieved and I don't need CSF diversion. I see, I see CSF coming right through there. Here's another example after resection of a medulloblastoma. Uh, and a little clot sitting in the aqueduct there. Just make sure we get that out. And just for observation and diagnostic purposes, that's what that uh, looks like. So, so that's what we're doing in the posterior fossa. Um, for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, subcortical and port-based approaches, which is really the newest uh, frontier for this. Um, so, uh, so what are the benefits of these approaches? Well, here's a 72-year-old man with colon cancer, single metastasis. You can see the tumor here uh, in the parietal occipital region, and that's the problem. 
The problem is the amount of edema this guy has and that he's symptomatic with apraxia and visual symptoms. If we were to gamma knife this, um, it would probably be successful, but we know about the edema that these patients get and how this can be, uh, how that can be uh, delayed as well. And corticosteroids, as we know, are not your immune system's friend. Cancer patients should not be on dexamethasone if they don't need to be. This is really the, uh, the I think the final frontier of what we're doing in, in tumor neurosurgery is understanding these subcortical connections. Um, a lot of my colleagues on the panel today have contributed to this work tremendously. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to see them here. Um, so here's the problem, collateral damage. This is how uh, we used to approach deep-seated uh, pathology. Um, there, there has to be a better way than manual retraction uh, for this. A lot of this was pioneered by uh, Pat Kelly uh, um, several decades ago using a CT scan and stereotactic frame. We've come a long way um, with a, a variety of ports available. This is the Nico brain path. Um, you can use a variety of optics, which I'm gonna talk about, and then obviously DTI planning as well. So um, a, lot of, a lot of people are interested in this for ICH. There's obviously a lot of trials going on for it. Um, we, we've done a lot of ICH work. I'm not gonna focus on that today, but um, I think we're still learning the indications and, and we're, we're excited to see what the, uh, the trials will show for this. But um, a lot of neurosurgeons, I, I think, um, understand that there, there is major benefit to evacuating these early. This was a neurologist who we treated who had an acute basal ganglia uh, and thalamic hemorrhage, um, left-sided weakness. We got him in within 24 hours. Uh, there's his DTI with the motor fibers pushed backwards uh, posteriorly. Um, there's the clot evacuation. And post-op day one, uh, he was sitting up in bed with dramatic improvement in his left-sided function and mental status as well. He's had a great recovery. Um, for tumors, there's never a reason you should compromise principles of tumor surgery if just because you're doing it minimally invasive. So we use the exact same tools we would use for open surgery. Um, we use a variety of imaging, uh, cortical and subcortical mapping, 5-ALA, uh, uh, and then uh, ultrasonography where needed. Um, so here's that gentleman I told you about with the brain met, just to kind of show you what that looks like. We would take a standard parietal occipital approach going through a sulcus. So we go uh, adjacent to the vessels here with preservation of the vein. We split the sulcus. We get down to the base of the sulcus. We use neuronavigation, and there's the trajectory. We dock right on the surface of this metastasis. Here's a small white matter cuff. And then um, obviously we need tissue for pathology. So important for all these cases. We're able to resect the tumor. Here we are using a, a side angled uh, aspirator here. And then achieving a hemostasis here. Then we back the port out and you'll see how the sulcus comes together over time and the vein is preserved. And he had a complete resection. We gamma knife the cavity and he's doing really well. I mentioned colloid cysts earlier and I was uh, lucky enough to work, uh, to work with some of our panelists on a, a multi-center retrospective series uh, that was published last year for colloid cysts. This is how I do my colloid cysts now. I think there's a lot of benefits here. So um, here's a sulcus here. This is a right frontal transcortical approach. We target the lateral ventricle. We're now working primarily in an air medium. Big difference and we're using two-handed microdissection, big difference. So I feel much safer dissecting this cyst away from the, uh, the uh, internal cerebral veins, the fornix, uh, and all the other delicate anatomy around here, um, rather than doing this with a, a channel approach where any small amount of bleeding um, can compromise your visualization and it turns into a, a, a festival of irrigation. So when the port is removed, I uh, just want to draw your attention to how that sulcus comes together. And then um, we got a complete resection, no CSF diversion. She's doing great, no recurrence. This is a, uh, a young man with a ruptured uh, cavernous angioma that um, was exophytic into the, the lateral and third ventricles. We, uh, this is a, a paradigm we've started developing this year, going from exoscopic to endoscopic. We call this E to E. Um, so we, we went along the long axis of this. So I wanted to approach this from the non-dominant side. You could obviously do this with an interhemispheric transcolosal approach. We wanted to avoid 
uh, um, any manipulation of the fornix and obviously retraction when possible. So we took a right frontal approach. This is about a 13 millimeter dural opening. Here's our sulcal uh, split here. We're now targeting the lateral uh, ventricle. This is a seven centimeter uh, brain path uh, uh, port with a, 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 I think 13 or 14 millimeter uh, diameter here. And now we're dissecting around the capsule. We're taking out the lateral ventricle component. We're then gonna toggle more medially to get a better view of the left-sided uh, 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 component. And we're gonna dissect this away from the contralateral uh, thalamus and hypo, hypothalamus. And that's what we're doing here. We're toggling more medially and then taking out the deeper nodule. So obviously with cavernous angiomas, it's very important to get the whole thing out. So how do we know we did that? We, this is where we'll pass an angled endoscope through the port to inspect the cavity, make sure we got everything out. So you'll see that in a minute here. So here goes the endoscope and we're now in that cavity. We're, we're turning this 360 degrees and making sure we got the whole thing out. And this kid did great. He did have a transient mem uh, short-term memory deficit that um, lasted several weeks. He had to go to rehab, but he recovered, uh, he recovered his function uh, several, uh, several weeks later. He's doing great. There's the post-op scan. I use this for intraventricular meningiomas as well. Um, it's a perfect approach for atrial-based uh, meningiomas. I've done, um, I've probably done about four or five of these. They're pretty rare, but they're fun cases. Uh, you have to watch out for the vasculature uh, behind the tumor and the choroid plexus. But um, the resolution on this video is a little worse, but it's really standard meningioma surgery. You debulk it, and then you work around the capsule. You fold it in. You find the feeding vessels. You sacrifice them, and then you... Uh, you take the tumor out. And so um, this, this approach really lends itself to these, these meningiomas. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end this by talking about um, subcortical glioma surgery and where I think there are some benefits here. So this is a, a guy with a deep-seated dominant uh, uh, basal ganglia region uh, glioblastoma. This is one of the first ones I did uh, with this approach. Here we are splitting the sulcus. And this one lent itself to resection. Um, uh, um, we did not do this awake because we took a very anterior trajectory. This was kind of a necrotic tumor. We were able to get um, a, a really nice volumetric resection, but I did not see one little satellite nodule that I'll show you here. So I did this one about, I wanna say about four, four or five years ago. Um, Dr. Chechana also has a, a ton of experience with these, uh, these, these gliomas um, uh, as well. So we're now removing the port. And you'll see the post-op scan here, and uh, we've got most of it out, but I didn't see this other nodule here. It's, it's, about, it's greater than 90% volumetric resection. He was intact. He went home uh, one or two days later and then obviously had standard therapy. So how can we improve on this paradigm? So um, there, a lot of us are using 5-ALA surgery, but um, uh, this was a, a, a case report um, by Dr. Berger's group at UCSF, where they had a, a lighted sucker for blue light. And uh, we had access to a, 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 a blue light endoscope that we repurposed. So this was a butterfly glioma. Um, we did not attempt a full resection on this for a, a variety of reasons. We wanted to just biopsy this. So we're using an 11 millimeter diameter uh, port for this, a very small port. And we'll do this with five ALA guidance with an endoscope, no microscope, no exoscope. And I know exactly what tissue I want to biopsy. It's very clear here what's tumor and what's not. And I pick the most uh, fluorescent component. We don't wait for frozens anymore if it's fluorescing um, and, and it's a suspected glioma. Uh, we will just take the we'll take tissue and 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 we'll close. And we've had a hundred percent diagnostic rate uh, doing that thus far. So I mentioned this E to E approach, and this has been uh, the paradigm that we've been working on uh, lately, where. Here's a deep-seated occipital glioblastoma. We would start this with a port-based approach. Um, as I mentioned before, a pride occipital approach. Here we are using the, the side-cutting aspirator here. And, and this is pretty obvious where tumor is. But when you get deeper is where, uh, with the endoscope, you can really see fluorescent tissue. And we've done several heads-up comparisons of microscopic to endoscopic blue light. And there, it's hands-down better with the endoscope. 
uh, we have a 30 degree angled scope. So we're looking at the walls and we're re removing additional tumor when it's safe to do so. We'll use this in conjunction with subcortical motor mapping. We've got really nice resections doing this. Um, so we'll, we'll continue resecting until we don't see any more fluorescence as long as it's safe to do so. And this guy had a gross total resection. So we call this, um, we're calling this the E to E exoscopic to endoscopic approach. We also do for, for, for cortical based uh, superficial glioblastoma, a microscopic to endoscopic approach. So I wanna just stop here for a second. Here's a comparison of the, micros of the endoscope, I'm sorry, on the left and the microscope on the right with, with the blue light. Let me just back up for one sec. So we've done mapping in this case. Uh, we know this is SMA territory. We know it's not involving uh, brocas. So here's our defined area. We'll, we'll do our cortical resection. This is all necrotic GBM, but here's the microscope. Um, pretty faint fluorescence there. Um, sometimes it can be variable. We're removing tumor here. And now here's a comparison of the endoscope to the microscope. So uh, we're seeing much more avid enhancement uh, with the endoscope resecting uh, high-grade gliomas uh, um, than the microscope. And we'll use the exact same paradigm. We're using subcortical motor mapping to make sure that this patient is safe or as safe as possible. 30-degree angled lens working along the wall to remove additional tumor. And we got a, a gross total resection. She had an SMA syndrome. Uh, she went to rehab and, and she's recovered um, uh, uh, almost completely. She's had a fantastic recovery. So with that, um, uh, I'm going to go back to where I started here as I wrap up. Uh, um, there has been this described evolution, potentially, of visualization and optical technology. I think it's all about versatility. I, I use all three of these techniques interchangeably. I think all trainees should learn to do so if you're going to be treating skull base and, uh, and, and complex tumor pathology. And each of these has their own mer merits and drawbacks. And so to tailor your approaches to each individual pathology and patient is uh, very critical. So future implications, um, uh, minimally invasive surgery is fun. Um, we're going to see so much uh, in terms of improvements over our careers, I hope. Um, uh, improved optical technology, robotic technology, VR, AR, uh, um, uh, systems, um, uh, new instrumentation with smart uh, instruments, multiple working channels, so much good stuff happening, um, and, and optical fluorescence as well. So I hope I've conveyed to you, um, there are really a variety of MIS and endoscopic approaches that are available to, to access multiple anatomical compartments and get us to a, a really a, a variety of, uh, of intrinsic and extra axial tumors. The endoscope has so many benefits in tumor surgery. Port-based approaches are for sure here to stay in evolution and provide major benefits for subcortical and intraventricular pathology. I think blue light endoscopy um, requires validation, but has some promising benefits that could help with a variety of different approaches. And then again, I just wanna emphasize versatility and, uh, and, and um, we're, we're really excited about some of these integrated uh, MTE and ETE approaches that we've been uh, working on. So with that, um, I uh, really want to thank uh, Dr. Ivan and the University of Miami Department of Neurosurgery and the Global Brain Tumor Symposium, and all my friends over there, and then uh, the panelists and attendees as well, as well as our whole team here at USC uh, and the Norris Cancer Center. So uh, Mike, thanks so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. That was that was outstanding. Thank you so much. It really does uh, bring together uh, what new and current uh, brain tumor and skull-based surgeons need to do to kind of really excel in today's today's world. Um, you know, it's becoming more complex. Patients are demanding more minimally invasive approaches, and you can't just be a specialist in one area, or one technique anymore. It's it's you really have to have a thorough understanding and ability to kind of uh, you know integrate endoscope, exoscope, uh, open surgery, and, and all the new tools and figure out when to use them the best. Uh, you know, the, the 5ALA with the endoscope, I feel like, is, is, is really a huge leap because the, the major issue I've seen with 5ALA is, is looking around the corner. You know, as the, as the brain kind of falls in, it, it kind of ends up hiding uh, if there's any glowing tumor because the, the direct light is not getting to it. And you end up leaving sometimes tumor if you're relying on it in an easy area that's like underneath the lip 
of the actual uh, resection cavity. And, and I could see how the endoscope would provide a huge benefit in ensuring that uh, you get a 360 degree, degree view of the resection cavity. Yeah, that's exactly right, Mike. And also bringing the light source into the cavity, I think is a big one as well. But yeah, looking around those corners is one of the limitations of direct light microscopy. So, so what percentage of procedures are you bringing in endoscope these days? I'm about 50% on endoscopic. The, the other half of my practice are standard open approaches and skull base approaches um, that, that there's really no role at this point for endoscopy or MIS surgery. So I'm, I'm about 50-50 um, in my practice. And I just wanted to see if you could comment on a couple of the different unique tools you also use. I saw that in your videos, you use the, the kind of the sonicator, the sonicating bone cutter. You also use a side cutter aspirator. What, what kind of uh, techniques do you feel like are, have really helped with, uh, with, with that endoscopic minimum approaches, if you had to name a few? Yeah, I guess, um, I, again, I'm about versatility and whatever you're comfortable with. So I, I still use the drill in certain cases. It depends what I'm doing and how fast I want to go. I, I do like the, uh, the bone cutting uh, aspirator for, for bony removal as well, um, mostly because there's no moving parts. You, don't, you won't wrap up soft tissue. And I like to let our residents and fellows do a lot of the approaches. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, just a, a, a drill can often wrap up soft tissue or um, cottonoids or stuff like that. So th that's one benefit. Um, I use the side cutting aspirator for some cases and I, I go back and forth between an ultrasonic aspirator as well, especially for glioma surgery. And then um, having a good bipolar is absolutely critical. Um, I'm using the endo pen, um, but, or, but having a long forceps is also critical. Uh, a, a really low profile, uh, long bipolar forceps, and you need long instruments. So with any of these keyhole approaches, it's good to have an endoscopic set available, whether they're, they're pistol grip, graspers, micro dissectors, long suctions, et cetera. Awesome. Uh, there was one other question uh, that came in that we'll get to, and then maybe uh, Kai could start. Uh, one from uh, Jose, uh, who wanted to ask about the keyhole approach and your uh, opinion on removing the superior orbit versus just doing the craniotomy like you were showing it. Yeah, he was saying that he felt like the aesthetics were better with removing the superior orbit and easier to reconstruct, and it's, it's faster for him. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, um, whatever your preference is, I don't like taking the orbital rim off um, unless it's a very high riding lesion. I don't find the need to do it. And I drill out the undersurface of the orbital rim. So it's essentially flush with the anterior cranial uh, uh, floor. And that's enough exposure for my cases. I think it's more morbid and it, uh, there's a higher risk of, of injuring the periorbitum and getting um, eye swelling and all that stuff or, or frontal sinus issues as well. So I, uh, I prefer not to, but I, I would never fault anyone, especially for a high riding lesion. Are you doing bone cement on those or to help with any kind of uh, aesthetics afterwards or no? No, I'm not. I just use low profile plating and, uh, and I don't really use, I use like the dog bone style, low, low profile plating and a multi-layer closure uh, um, and, and a sealant, but I, I'm not using cement, but I think cement would be very valid in this approach actually. Sure. Okay, great. So let's get to uh, some of the cases. Kai, if you want to start. Okay, Gabe, okay, this is a case if you want to take a look. Um, so this is a 59-year-old male. I think I'm unmuted, but uh, with the history of renal cell cancer, status post nephrectomy and hypertension, he presented with confusion. He underwent a right nephrectomy followed by radiation chemotherapy. Um, his last PET scan was negative, so he didn't really have any systemic disease except for this brain lesion here. You can see it's not really, it's more in the atrium versus in the body in the atrium, the lateral ventricle. He has a lot of edema. He's right-handed, um, dominant hemisphere. So I don't know what you, what you would do with this case and how I did it, um, but go ahead. Yeah, maybe you want to, maybe Brad, uh, what, what are your, or Brad, yeah. you will start with yeah, Brad. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think obviously that your concern here is that this is obviously metastatic spread. And I think, you know, given the, the size of the lesion and the extent of the edema and the radio resistant histology, I think there's a real, real valid argument for, for resecting this. Um, yeah, I, I'd probably consider, it, you know, uh, an intraparietal sulcal approach to this. You'd be worried about the vascularity of the lesion. I'd want to take a real good look at where we think kind of that, that vascular pedicle is coming from or its primary supply. Um, but that's how I would, let's see. Yeah, that almost has it looking more like it's the lab or kind of the pulvinar posterior part of the thalamus there. Um, 
Not quite as intro than Trick Miller. See that Corona. Yeah, I'd probably come like an intrabridal circle approach right down onto it. Um, kind of that that high point medially that sticks up seems to have you along kind of the dominant axis of it. So, so basically, you want me to tell you what I did, Mike? Is that yeah, sure. Awesome. So I did what exactly you did, Brad. I kind of regret it. Uh, so I did it through a. Uh, <laughs> Um, a, a tubular retractor, brain path, tubular retractor through the endoparietal sulcus had a lot of problems with hemostasis and getting around the thing. Cause anytime you're in the ventricle with these tubes, unfortunately, when you're in the parenchyma, you can limit the bleeding to the tube itself. But when you're in the ventricle, it can bleed outside the tube and you're not seeing what's going on, on the outside. So I had a lot of hematoma. And so I had to go back. I went in through the tube, took out the tube, advanced a different type of tube in their vicor, which is bigger. It just creates more space to try to look for all that blood evacuate the blood for the most part he actually ended up doing okay but it was just a, a nightmare of a case in terms of the ventricle the other thing too is this dominant hemisphere you're coming across a lot of white matter tracks your superior longitudinal fasciculus your ocular fasciculus no matter what track what path you take even if it's interparietal sulcus it's not really to the atrium you have to go to the body so you're cutting across a lot of uh, important real estate so he did have some weakness on the other side and luckily it resolved um but it was it was a hellish of a case to use through a tube retractor so yeah, that, that's a tough one. I, I have a case that I'll, that I'll show that kind of gets to something similar, kind of some of those similar kind of nuances, but, but I, yeah, it's a tough case. Yeah, that's a tough one. In renal cell in particular, I think uh, you, the part of the challenges of the tubular approaches are vascular lesions, whether they're GVMs or, or vascular mats. And so that, that is a tricky one. Uh, Kai, in retrospect, what would you have done? Because I, I probably would have done an inner hemispheric on this. Yeah, so I would have done an inner hemispheric come in the ventricle through a more, a bigger approach and that we have uh, more flexibility in getting around the lesion. Yeah. And that was going to be my question. I think, uh, uh, Gabe, when you were showing some of the interventricular meningioma approaches too, how often do you get like a CTA ahead of time, understand where that vascular pedicle is, and then change your kind of your, your, your trans approach to maybe something that would be more anterior to the lesion to kind of attack that first. Uh, uh, to be completely honest, I haven't done that, Mike. I, I'll, I'll just go in um, uh, uh, and, and find the vasculature as I'm debulking it and folding the capsule in. But I, I think that would be a good idea, actually. I just haven't yeah. done it. Yeah, I had, a, I had a similar case to this one. It was like a, a, a large, uh, it was actually just a GBM, but uh, it ended up not being a necrotic GBM. It ended up being a hypervascular GBM. And, and I got in there with the port, very similar to this case. And uh, and basically just had to convert really quickly to open to kind of control it because it was bleeding into the ventricle and bleeding that was outside of the port itself that needed to be controlled. So I agree, it is, it is tough with those uh, vascular cases, but it sounds like you had a great recovery here. Thanks for presenting that one. Uh, Brad, you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, uh, Gabby, that was, that was a, an amazing kind of whirlwind tour of, of your expertise in minimally invasive neurosurgery. And I think there's so many salient points there. Um, I think, you know, as for, for, for somebody like an expert like yourself in, in the endoscopic and the nasal technique, I think the way you've kind of developed your approach to the kind of plane of tuberculum meningiomas, I think is similar to, to, um, how, how a lot of people have maybe moved in terms of. Of the open, I think it's always good for certainly for trainees to keep in mind is not just the hot new technique to, that you have to be married to, and that that some of these things that people do so well with the minimally invasive craniotomy, and it's it's not you know um, uh, a, a loss by doing that over over an nasal technique. I would also echo your your comments about the specific instrumentation, and I think so many of these these techniques um, and the instrumentation. Um, work seamlessly across the spectrum. So all the endonasal instruments are the same instruments I use through the tube or the same instruments I would use with an endoscopic, you know, approach to, you know, to the pineal region. And so being familiar with those instruments, having your staff be familiar and having them available is absolutely crucial. So um, I have two cases here of trying to 
guess maybe what what uh, Zadar was not going to talk about. This is again just just kind of echoing uh, his points on on a college cyst. I, I think this has really become the workhorse approach for these. It works so well with almost every cyst. Um, and this is just a case of somebody with a small cyst. And I think um, you know you get a you know, long discussion on on whether or not to to operate on some of these smaller cysts and. You know, some sentiment that maybe these are not quite as benign as, as many of us think. And so um, the CCRS, it's called it's risk score, you know, take it for what it's worth, size, age, presence of headache and flare hyperintensity, as well as where it's located within the third ventricle is just one means of estimating risk, but a variety of approaches that, that he's already addressed. But see, you're a very small cyst, but with some mild ventricular asymmetry and progressive, really debilitating symptoms. A little flare hyperintensity you see in the middle. It's located actually just posterior to the frame and underneath. Um, and, and this is just done with the brain path. But I think you could see here, even without frank ventricular megaly, this approach still works. Um, so while it makes it a little bit more difficult to cannulate into the ventricle, it's certainly um, not one that, can, that can't be done. So again, I think to, to encourage you to, to try this for those cases. And this gets a little bit more to what Kai was talking about. 49 year old woman with really episodic symptom that, that really led to incidental finding of this left atrial meningioma. And, and I, I think um, the, the tubular based approaches and the intraparietal sulcal approach to these, um, which is really a slight modification of the traditional superior parietal lobule approach that I think a lot of us had originally kind of trained with um, to access these. And I think to Kai's point, a lot of critical white matter tracts here um, and just to kind of show, you know, the anatomy of the intraparietal sulcus, the underlying white matter tracts, and these are just two references um, that really beautifully show the dissection of the white matter um, in layers down to the um, atrium through the intraparietal sulcus. And there's a variety of nuances of, of where you approach. I'm interested in, in, in what Kai and what uh, Gabby, think, you know, so the traditional approach had been at the intersection of the intraparietal sulcus and the postcentral gyrus. Um, you know, and the people came along and do about a third of the way back or half of the way back. And then there's some who do it at the intersection of the parietal occipital sulcus and the intraparietal sulcus. Again, all of this with the idea to reduce kind of white matter tract. So on, on the left here from this Gustantakis article is the traditional approach, a little bit more anterior, up and down, a little bit more lateral as opposed to this approach that's a little bit more parallel with the midline, comes a little bit more posterior to anterior. And that's typically the approach I take. Um, and so um, this is just kind of showing the presence of the intraparietal sulcus here about a middle third uh, of the way back and, and kind of arrow pointing to where that is in the axial, sagittal and coronal planes. That's not that case. And um, I recently did this case and cannulated down um, and, and ended up actually converting to open and not really because of the dramatic vascularity, but um, because of the size and consistency of the lesion, um, but utilize the, the trajectory and the beautiful dissection plane through the sulcus that the tube created, and then resected in the exact same way without retractors. Um, and so I think, you know, being willing to have a, a second plan and out, um, that if it's not working through the tube, it's okay to take that tube out and do it with traditional instrumentation or with the same instruments, but, but just without the tube there, if that's limiting you, I mean, your ability to safely do the operation. So um, uh, I think to guys' point, you got to have a back out, a back out plan um, if it doesn't work and you can't be married just to the technique. So. Okay. Thanks. Those are, those are great points, Brad. Um, I, I've had, to, I've converted on um, two GBMs that were really vascular to microscopic and, and uh, that was a little earlier on. Now I think I, with case selection, I, I, I go for kind of more manageable ones that I, I think even if they're bloody, I'll be able to handle. Oh yeah, absolutely. Kai, any thoughts about the entry point for your uh, uh, parietal approaches? Yeah, I agree. The inner parietal sulcus is the bulk of my um, access to the posterior thalamus, atrium, and the ventricle, things like that. The other good one is the parietal occipital sulcus. Um, it's a bigger sulcus. It's easier to dissect. It puts you more closer to the midline, so you're nearby those veins. Um, but both of those are my two working corridors, basically, for the parietal uh, area. Just curious, randomly, how, how do you guys position for your intraparietal sulcus approaches to, to the atrium? 
Uh, so I do basically lateral and then I uh, flex the head up, uh, like flex the neck up. Um, pride occip pride occipital, I keep a neutral prone. Um, I try to keep everything midline for most of my cases. Um, just like anything like in the middle cerebellar pinnacle when I'm using the brain path, I'll do straight prone rather than park bench just so everything stays neutral um, just in case I get disoriented. Yeah. Okay. Um, Simon? Okay. Um, first, uh, yeah, I just want to echo on what Brad was saying, you know, Gabe, that's just a phenomenal talk and really pushing the envelope. And, you know, I think it's, it's obviously benefited, you know, us as kind of a younger generation and, and, you know, patients that, you know, we've seen, we've seen these kind of trailblazing operations and, these videos, and I think it's emboldened us to try these things. So, you know, very grateful, you know, to you and the people who've contributed to this. And uh, Kai, I think that was a, a great case because you know, they don't all go so well, you know? And so sometimes hard to admit, especially in a forum where you're kind of presenting, you know, to many people that sometimes doesn't go so well. I think there's, a, you know, really a lot of value in that. And some of these, I know Mike knows that I've, I've presented some of my own complications. This one though actually went well. So I want to, you know, I think it's an interesting one. I think it kind of picks up where Gabe's uh, talk um, left off. So there are two interesting aspects to this case and one we'll just go through quickly. Uh, patient's 58 years old and she presented just with an episode of dizziness that was self-limited, but she still went ahead because her primary was concerned. Patient never really had these symptoms before and went ahead and got this MRI. I think one aspect of this case is, you know, what the hell is this thing? What are you going to do with this early stage? Um, so I did kind of the, the usual things. I got a CT of the chest up and pelvis. I got a lumbar puncture on this woman. And I had a suspicion it was probably something bad. Obviously, it's enhancing. And there's some flare abnormality. But thought it was a little small. And she wasn't symptomatic. So I just ended up doing an MRI. Everything was negative And did an MRI six weeks later. And then it was this. So I think the discussion here, and, I, and I'll admit very openly that Rick Komatar had a, you know, we went back and forth on this and he really helped uh, strategize uh, for me on this case. But um, how do you, you know, how would you approach this is, is the obvious question here. And, um, you know, here is, here are the thoughts that we had. Here's a sagittal projection, but um, you know, beginning with the first choice being open surgical resection, you know, would you do this as an awake and do, you know, traditional speech mapping and then go transcortical, transsulcal, what have you, um, knowing that it's quite deep and that language is almost certainly going to be uh, an issue with your, with your uh, trajectory. Um, or, and this is what we ultimately opted for, um, would you take kind of a longer parietal corridor using Vicor, whatever your, your port-based approach would be, um, either intraparietal sulcus, which is what we chose because uh, it was a little bit higher, um, or parietal occipital sulcus, which, which we ended up not approaching here. Um, would you just consider a needle biopsy only given how you know highly eloquent that area uh, is? Um, or would you consider biopsy and at the same time doing a laser ablation, which I think is uh, you know an interesting strategy for some of these deep-seated uh, lesions based on the frozen pathology, of course, indicating that it's a, a high-grade glioma as opposed to a lymphoma, which just did not appear to be like at all. So we opted here for the um, parietal corridor. Um, uh, sadly, I don't have any intraoperative video here, but um, I, do, I just took a video here of the, of the post. Um, and so you can see on the sagittal here, the, the trajectory. We used the, the Vicor you know, I just looked back at my op report. I'm surprised I did it through only a 12 uh, millimeter uh, width. I, I, that's pretty narrow. I probably would have opened up the sulcus more than a 17 now, having done more of these, but we use a seven centimeter length. I'm um, obviously fairly long trajectory. And I probably got a little luckier here than anything. I mean, it was a very good resection. Um, as, a, as, as far as GBMs go, this behaved way more like a metastasis then it did like a GBM. It was solid, even though there was some cystic fluid there that came out early, it was very easy to define the planes on this. And so just with a little bit of piecemeal dissection, 
fairly quickly, I was able to mobilize this away from the subcortical white matter there and bring it up to the tube. And she did very well clinically. And I, I think that this is a case where without the tubular retractor, I just don't think that this approach is even viable. I, I just don't even think you can adequately visualize or get down and keep your corridor open. I mean, you can make kind of that makeshift cottonoid corridor, um, which you know I, I would do on occasion before these really became more, uh, you know, more readily employed. And I almost certainly would have approached this as a kind of larger craniotomy, speech, you know, wake with speech mapping ordeal. But um, yeah, that's how we ended up approaching this. And um, she ultimately, she actually sadly passed away fairly recently, but that's more than a couple of years after this was done. So, um, you know, fared, fared well. And, you know, be interested to hear what any of the panelists think about that approach and, you know, what they would have done in that circumstance. Uh, Simon, that's a great case. Um, I, I really like the approach you took. I guess the one question I have is, um, did you get DTI ahead of time? Uh, yeah, so we did. And um, I just, this is at my old institution. I just couldn't find it for this. Um, but yeah, no, it's a great question. And um, yeah, I, there was nothing abnormal. What, what I recall is fairly well, is that there was nothing, you know, atypical about the mapping or, you know, the obviously optic radiations and of course, you know, Warnicke's actually she mapped fairly well. Her language was, wasn't great before the surgery. So the signals weren't kind of as robust and there was a decent amount of edema there that I'm not representing. Um, but yeah, I mean, obeying kind of, you know, obeying the, the, the DTI mapping and kind of avoiding those, uh, you know, avoiding that based on your trajectory, I think is a very relevant uh, consideration here. Well, I agree with you. I like to, I like taking a posterior approach, if the, especially if the motor fibers are pushed anteriorly, obviously, and avoiding Wernicke's. Um, for me, that's what it's about. And uh, yeah, Wernicke. Yeah, the motor fibers were definitely anterior, and Wernicke's was. Um, uh, there were there were two areas, if I remember correctly. One was just anterior to this, and one was a little bit lateral. But there was nothing, you know, in the you know along the trajectory that that we planned here. Simon, did you do this awake or asleep? I did it asleep. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a good question. Would, would you guys have done this awake even with that more parietal? No, I would have yeah. done it the way, you, the way you did it. Yeah, I did yeah, it. So I've, yeah. I've done a couple of cases awake with the tube and the tube stretches those white matter tracks. So you'll find when you pass that tube, they'll have deficits and you take out the tube and the deficits will resolve hmm. or not the most resolve. So then you're, you're like, what did I, you don't know. If you're doing awake for me, you don't know what you're what, if it's permanent or temporary, you'd end up taking out the tube. Um, mm. But I would have, I, I probably wouldn't use the two for this or, but if I would have, I would have used that sulcus that you show on the axial. Um, so it's more through the temporal lobe or the parietal lobe. I can't tell where, but that's where I would approach. Cause it looks like it's below the sulcus, but if it doesn't, then I would have done the same approach that you did. Yeah. Great case, Simon. I'm glad you got a, uh, you know, that was a good outcome or a great outcome, I should say. So nice, nice job. Yes. Um, Ashish? Let me load up my screen here. Anyways, thank you guys for having me. What a, a great talk by Dr. Zada and uh, great cases so far. Um, I'm one of the uh, chief residents here in Miami and I've kind of had the pleasure of being trained by Rick and Mike and kind of got a great experience in kind of um, port-based systems and, you know, MIS approaches to uh, cranial tumor surgeries. So um, I'm glad to get, uh, glad to get your opinions on some cases here to present to you guys, if you don't mind. Um, you know, I think the port-based system has kind of revolutionized neurosurgery and, you know, we kind of described our experience with, uh, you know, our Johns Hopkins colleagues and Mayo Clinic uh, recently. And, you know, we've had some a pretty robust experience of cases, uh, this is like just a, uh, a small smattering of cases over the last few years that we kind of reported. Um, uh, you know, as you can see, a large you know variety of pathologies. You know, cavernoma, colloid cyst, a few GBMs, um, few, a few intraventricular meningi meningi meningiomas, and um, and um, uh, a lot of metastases. So, uh, you know, obviously, you know, as we discussed, you know, these these approaches are um, super versatile um, for uh, for deep seated lesions. 
Um, at our institution, we tend to favor the Vicor system. Um, I think for several reasons, A, it's like cheaper, B, the, uh, you know, its ability to be able to put in the uh, stealth directly down the tube um, allows you to have a little bit more uh, visualization and accurate trajectory planning. So, um, you know, for those reasons, we like, uh, we like the Vicor system. Also, it tends to be a little wider, so your bimanual technique is a little bit easier as well. So um, just in our experience, we tend to favor that system. Um, and uh, I guess I can get some cases here um, uh, just to get your opinion on how you'd manage this. This is a 60-year-old uh, who presented with altered mental status. Uh, he presented uh, to the ER kind of an extremist. He was kind of localizing, um, uh, obtunded, not really following commands. Uh, he has a lung mass on chest x-ray and then this lesion. Uh, this is a case of Dr. Ivan's actually. So I don't know if anybody can, you know, kind of give their opinion on how they want to, how they manage this. Maybe Simon? Yeah, it's a little tough for me to tell them to see. It looks like an insanely dilated temple horn there. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, obviously a tough one. Um, I mean, I think it's it kind of lends itself to what we've been discussing through the you know the tubular approach, kind of left left parietal, you know, intraparietal sulcus perhaps. What you don't love is you know, if the mass was more in that temporal horn dilated area, it'd be an easier circumstance. It looks like the bulk of the mass on the MR is kind of just up in that lateral ventricle and more collapsed kind of region around it. So it might be a tougher visualization, but that's just where it is. And it's got the downstream temporal entrapment. So I think, it, I think a tube for this and not, not trying to be so biased by the forum <laughs> um, is, uh, you know, is, is reasonable. Um, I d highly doubt that I would, I personally would do an interhemispheric here. I, I probably would try that approach. Yeah, yeah. I think that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. I would do the same thing. I think this gets to, to Mike's point of, uh, you know, kind of knowing where the vascular supply comes from. So it's, it's pretty, I think, uh, typical with the atrial meningioma comes kind of medially from the choroid where it's a little different, maybe some with, with what's a presumptive metastasis and it may kind of siphon off vessels. And so I think understanding where that is, and it, it looks like the main kind of vascular supply is probably distal to you and it be prepared for it to be vascular. Um, but yeah, I, I think a tubular based kind of parietal approach is, is, is a very reasonable thing for this with an attempt to try to decompress that ventricle. Yeah, and I think this may be in a good case, you know, to kind of, you know, use the endoscope to kind of, you know, look into the ventricle, you know, after you're done and kind of make sure it's all communicating, um, you know, kind of that E to E thing that Dr. Zada was mentioning. Um, uh, we, you know, you know, given the fact that he had this, you know, very dilated temporal horn, we kind of put in, put in like a bedside EVD kind of parallel uh, perpendicular uh, here, um, just underneath sylvian fissure, transtemporal. Um, went okay, and then we did exactly what you said, kind of a parietal approach, and took out the tumor. We had a little edema post-op uh, just from um, just from some manipulation of some uh, of, of a vein, but uh, we were able to get good control, and patient ended up doing uh, well after surgery. So um, this is kind of an interesting case uh, from that. Um, his, his his temporal horn ended up resolving uh, after the tumor was uh, uh, tumor was removed. Um, this is uh, one more case. Just kind of want to get your opinion on this. A thirty-five. Just, just to comment on that other case. I mean, you know, again, uh, not, not to harbor the point, but we, I think we chose a more superior trajectory in that case, just because the uh, what Brad was saying was just to kind of have that anterior view down the uh, the axis of the choroidal, where the choroidal um, art posterior choroidal was kind of feeding it, was I thought was going to be helpful rather than coming just the horn was so dilated there was tempting just to come almost just just above the occipital lobe kind of through the atrium, but uh, we decided to come more superior. Anyway, just was a thought. Vascular? Was it a vascular tumor, Mike? Uh, it, it wasn't that vascular, but there was like a very large feeding artery that was there that we did. That was the last kind of thing we ended up taking. Yeah, I think a, a key point here is, just, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, you know, you can get, uh, I was getting kind of greedy during this case in terms of the resection. So it's always kind of good to, you know, be piecemeal in terms of resection, especially when you're using a tubular approach, because you know you can you kind of yank on vessels that are on the back side of the tumor, and then that can cause some bleeding into the ventricle and you know cause issues. Um, so uh, I think piecemeal resections are are pretty critical here. 
Um, this is just a 35 year old male who presented with uh, progressive headaches and this, uh, you know, this uh, kind of colloid cyst here at Fairman Monroe, um, you know, you know, at our institution, we kind of have this, you know, ongoing persistent debate about tubular versus inner hemisphere for these, this, these lesions and, uh, you know, kind of visualization. We know, I know Dr. Benjamin likes to use the endoscope uh, for resection of these lesions and, you know, uh, as well. So I uh, kind of want to get, you know, uh, everybody's opinion on how, what, how they usually approach college cysts and then also trajectory planning. I mean, you know, we, we kind of, uh, at our institution, we try to uh, favor a kind of uh, more um, kind of basal frontal kind of uh, approach uh, rather than kind of coming in at more of a coker's point angle just to be able to elevate the tumor off the veins. Um, um, I don't know if that's the same uh, kind of biases that everybody else uh, uh, uses uh, in their kind of uh, port-based system for college cysts. Yeah, that's a really important consideration, Ashish. I, I kind of split the difference when I do them because you're trading off um, uh, length and depth um, as well. So um, it, it depends if it's left versus right sided, but I, I'll split the difference uh, between Coker's point and taking a, a, a very far frontal approach. But you're right, absolutely. You want to look, you want you want the best view superiorly that you can get of the veins and uh, especially in the roof of the third ventricle. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, I come basically at the hairline, which, you know, as opposed to kind of going through a brow or on the forehead. So I, I try to take, use that as my anterior limit for the most part to try to get that anterior to posterior view. But yeah, I, I would do this with, with a tube. I think this would be done very nicely. Yeah, it was, you know, it ended up going pretty well, uh, pretty nice resection. There was a little small component of the capsule kind of attached to some veins uh, at the roof of the third ventricle. So we kind of left uh, that uh, um, uh, on, on the uh, on the veins there, but had a really good resection. The patient ended up doing well and left uh, uh, post-operative day one. But um, yeah, I mean, this is a constant debate about the inner hemispheric, you know, kind of transcolosal versus, you know, this approach. And I think, uh, you know, we have like kind of 50-50 or faculty are split on it, but. Was that a colloid cyst? Yes, it was. Um, and then I guess this kind of brings me to my next point is like, I don't know if anybody's tried, uh, you know, uh, doing uh, the kind of Vicor approach to for central neurocytomas. Uh, you know, we've had a few patients, you know, we've kind of done, uh, you know, a, a Vicor or a tubular based approach for central neurocytomas. Uh, and, you know, um, they ended up being very, very bloody. And, you know, a few of them we had to convert to open. So I'm kind of curious, you know, um, if anybody's tried uh, approaching these kind of very vascular lesions uh, through, um, you know, these uh, um, two base approaches. I mean, for me, pretty much any lateral ventricular gaze, I'll use a tube based approach. Um, I haven't had an issue, like including the vascular ones. I mean, you know, it's vascular, but it just creates a corridor for you so you can work in, you can use those bladed retractors. And I mean, you're creating a tube anyways, but it's just more comfortable that you're not taking white matter all the way in during a whole case for that. So for me, any lateral ventricular case, I use a tube. Makes yeah. sense. You. Go ahead. Sorry. You know, I, I agree with Kai. I mean, I, I had one recently. It was just very unenjoyable for the reasons you described. I think the tube helped me. I don't think it would have been easier through another approach. I don't think it was a tube issue. I just think that, you know, the tumor just, those tumors can be brutal, very inherent, very bloody. Uh, you know, as a young guy, it was progressively enlarging and he didn't have hydro from it, but it was growing and, you know, ended up not being able to wean the EVD and having to shunt them, et cetera. But he, he ultimately was fine, but yeah, it was not enjoyable. I think the central neurocytomas are, are just inherently, they can pose challenges. Yeah, I yeah. think the, the size of it is a big factor. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the smaller ones, I think, uh, are worthwhile chasing with the tubular approach. But if they get too big, it, it gets really hard to do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's kind of what I, I've come to decide going forward is that AP diameter, especially uh, if you do an inner hemispheric approach, you just have a lot more wiggle room with the ability to kind of look really far back and really far forward. Uh, and you could do that, I think, with the port by coming from a, a different angle, but then your anatomy is, is a little bit distorted with a, with a large tumor that you're going to be there all day, and you're trying to understand the thalamus bilaterally, um, and, and so sometimes it's better to come straight down on it, but interhemispheric for the large ones, but the small ones, I agree, is, is port base is much better. Yeah. All right. Um. This is another just quick case is, you know, kind of, you know, belaboring the point, but, you know, we had a great uh, approach through, you know, tube, tube based system through for uh, atrial meningioma, gross to resection went well, just 
kind of like a little happy moment, but it's uh, basically about it. Thanks, Ashish. I appreciate those cases. Um, uh, one other question came up here. For, for the trans it looks like a lot of people are phasing trans not trans gyral approaches. Uh, you know, I, I'd find that in about 50% of mine, you get down in the bottom of the trans approach and there is arteries kind of at the bottom there. Uh, do you spend the time to kind of mobilize that last little bit of the bottom of the sulcus or do you at some point just decide to kind of go into the side of the gyrus and for these approaches? I don't, I don't even dissect far enough down to see. So I just dissect super, the superficial few millimeters of the sulcus. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I predominantly do it with the, the brain path system um, and, and then just put it through. And, and it hasn't been an issue in terms of kind of bleeding on the way out or venous occlusion um, or arterial bleeding. So I'm not actually looking at the base of the sulcus, I'm just planning the trajectory and then doing superficial dissection. What, what do other people do? Yeah, I agree. I, uh, I'll, I'll go maybe a little deeper than that, but not always to the base of the sulcus. And I, will, I obviously won't take any vessels there. And I haven't had issues with bleeding with that. Okay. Likewise, I'm the exact same. Okay, great. Great. Uh, and then the last question was for, for Gabe, for your super serial inventorial approaches. Um, again, so is that approach where you're doing mostly endoscopic kind of, or is again, depending on the size of the, the lesion and, and, and whatnot, and are you always doing a much smaller opening for those, or you really think in those posterior fossas? I know you're not doing any retrosigmoids, but for the superseral inventorial, I was just wondering how many of those you're doing endoscopically. For the pineal ones, I'm doing them fully endoscopically now. Yeah, okay. and I, you know, if, if it's a huge tumor, I'll I, I I may not do that. But for the ones that we're going after, they're um they, we don't even bring a microscope in. We uh, we do the craniotomy. Um, we, uh, we mobilize the cerebellum just a little bit with cotinoids and then we put the endoscope in and the rest of the dissection is done with the endoscope. And, uh, and after you drain some CSF, um, it, the, the cerebellum's out of your way and uh, it, it's really a great approach, especially ergonomically. So they're, they're pure endoscopic. Um, you know, th these tumors don't come, up, don't come up all the time. We just published our series of, I don't remember, it was like eight tumor, eight or something like that, uh, purely endoscopic uh, cases. And last question from the audience here, Adham asks, you know, we talked about obviously a lot of the complications that could occur. I think we may have overstated that a little bit tonight because I think in most cases, these cases go extremely smooth. But his question is, how often are you converting from tube to open? I know I know, all of us here have kind of been on multi-institutional papers. So uh, any one of us could kind of answer in a car game, what were your, be your quotes that you quote? Well, there's a learning curve. Number one, that's the learning curve is, is uh, it's, it's definitely there. Um, people quote 10 cases, five cases, what, but it's, it's continuous. Um, uh, I still learn every time I do a port based case. Um, I converted, I think two or three in my initial 20 cases. Uh, like I said, for va um, two vascular GBMs and uh, maybe a hematoma where I had to put one in for swelling reasons, but um but since then, I haven't converted one. So um, I think it's a lot of it's about case selection, actually. And and as you get better at case selection, I think the the, the requirement to convert goes down as well. So I've never actually converted to open, but I've converted to from brain path to Vicor um, just to give me more flexibility. But I've never actually converted to an open case. And I probably have 75 cases through a port. OK, great. Yeah. OK. Well, it's 6.30. I just want to thank everybody for, for all their time. I really appreciate this. this is a phenomenal, phenomenal talk uh, and discussion. Uh, I think it's going to help a lot of uh, young surgeons and, and old surgeons who are, are now starting to use port-based surgery much, much more often as well as endoscopic surgery. So thank you all and, and have a good Thanksgiving. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving.